This is Reading News Review, and I'm Rob Redding, America's Independent Voice. And we have a special segment of the show today with some debaters who have done some incredible things. And, you know, I told you last year about the strides that black debaters were making across the country with Emporia State, and it continues with Towson and Oklahoma and what they've done. And we're also joined again by James Rowland, the Director of Community Outreach and Engagement Scholarship and Director of Atlanta Urban Debate League. We are all on a call together, and we're missing one person from Tozen, but we'll get to that in a moment. First, we'll go with, of course, the CETA National Champions, Tozen. Who do I have on the phone with me? I'm Corey Johnson from Towson. <laughs> Corey Johnson, and then we have Oklahoma on the phone with me. You got uh, George Lee and Rashid Campbell. Right, and Rashid actually won a huge award, top speaker at the National Debate Tournament, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment and the significance of that. Now, as a little background here, I I want to explain why we're doing this, because this, this is very important. Last year we had Emporia State on and Emporia State was the first team ever and correct me if I'm wrong here James the first team ever to win two national championships in the same year CETA and NDT and they were black and that's the first time that's ever been done by two black teams uh, of course or one black team in one year correct well, I would go even farther to put it in perspective. It's the first time any team of any color, black, blue, red, yellow, green, uh, pick a color in the rainbow, and uh, they that was the first time that's ever been accomplished by any team to win both CETA National, which is a cross-examination debate association tournament, and a national debate tournament. So it was huge on, on multiple fronts. And so no one's ever done that, and that was that was huge. And so now the first person – to, or the first team to ever win, ever black team to win was Tozen back in 2008. That was the cross-examination debate, right? That's correct. Okay. And that was in 2008. And then we come up to 2013, and we have two tournaments, the two major tournaments in debate that are won by one team. And that's never been done, and that team happened to be black. Yes, that's, that's correct. All right, this year in 2014, I just—I mean, there's a lot of history happening on this phone. So I, I, I want to say that there's been another big win. This time, CETA has been won again by Telson, and that was the first time we've ever seen an all-black final between Telson and Oklahoma, which we have both of the teams on the phone with us, except one missing from Tozen. And that was incredible. But if that's not incredible enough, we went to NDT where both teams went on and took their epic struggle uh, to the National Debate Tournament. And when they got to the National Debate Tournament, Rashid was able to place top speaker, which is the first time, the first black person ever to get top speaker at the National Debate Tournament. Am I right? That is that is 100% correct. Yes, sir. Now, I heard somebody wanted to add something in. No, I was just saying yes, sir. <laughs> okay, and that's just huge. That's huge. If I miss any history before we get started about all of this and why this is important. No, I think you've kind of put uh, some of it in perspective. You know, because, you know, I ain't getting any accolades at my, you know, brother Rashid and my sisters over there, you know. But uh, I didn't do debate in high school at all. I, I walked on to the team. So, you know, uh, I've been told, I've been trying to put it in perspective. I mean, I, I, I walked on to the team in college. So I've been trying to just put it in perspective or whatever, just uh, what I've been able to accomplish a little bit, not to, to toot my own horn at all, but, you know, just uh, put it in perspective what I've accomplished as far as walking on to the debate team, coming in raw with no understanding about the activity as much and being able to kind of, like, finish, you know what I mean, in, in the top ten, uh, actually top, top five, as you would say. Yeah. It was the first first black team. I guess the first black team to go undefeated at the NDT and be uh, number one seed in the uh, like was 65th annual in the like, 65th annual uh, national debate tournament in prelims. 68. 
Wait a minute. Yeah. Wait a minute. Okay. Okay. I did miss some history. All right. So let let let's back up a little bit because I want to be <laughs> I want to be I'm just so happy for you guys. I really am. I'm happy for those and I'm happy for Oklahoma because we 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 just started now. Right? We got some time. So so just so, so give me a little bit of leash here because I'm about to run away with it. So so you say that you are the first ever black seated team to be number one at the national debate tournament as well. Yes, sir. Number one seed. Number one seed was top seed. Right. Wow. You only dropped one battle, too. <laughs> and who did you drop to? Who did you lose to? No, 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 no. no. We didn't no, lose any debate, but at the NDT, at the National Debate Tournament, there's three judges at the back of every single round. Oh, yeah. Right, yeah. So what that meant was that every single round, we won on a 3-0 decision, except for the last round, we won on a 2-1 to Northwestern, who's the uh, – they were the defending Copeland champs, which means they won the most – Debate rounds or slash debate uh, tournaments of the season, and we only dropped one ballot to them, but we still beat them. But they took a ballot from them. <laughs> wow! So, so let me let let me go back also. And Rashid, Rashid, are you saying that you walked on the t- to the team? No, no, it's me. I'm George, 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 I walked, George, on, walked the on the team. I just want to be clear. Okay, now Rashid, you you you've got a lot of previous debate experience. Uh, well, I only did like a, a year or so in high school at the Bay Area Urban Debate League. So, and it's nothing like college. So, I mean, it was pretty much just a bunch of like kids from the hood yelling at each other. It wasn't really organized like a right. college policy <laughs> debate is, but it was some sort of debate nonetheless. Okay, let's 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 conclude the the, the, the history that we made on the phone. Then Let, let's solidify this because I I want to I want to make sure that it's clear. We're talking CETA, Cross-Examination Debate Association. Tozen goes toe-to-toe with you, Oklahoma, and you are the first ever black final, okay, ever in CETA history. No, 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 no. Kind of, but not really. There was, there was a black final last year between Emporia and West Georgia, but, I mean, it wasn't all black as in my brother. My brother. No, he's definitely black. No, listen, 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 listen. Let me, let me, let me spe- specify. Let me specify. <laughs> There's a debate on the phone about whether it's all black or not. <laughs> is it Barack Obama black or is it? Is it what, what are we talking about? Is we we got white mama in here somewhere? <laughs> Go ahead. Well, well, is it all black or not? Go ahead, Rashid. Because they're confused with it. Yeah. Yeah, it's two. It's been two all black. And that was the second all black final. This is the second in 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 in, in two years. The second in a row. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Most row. importantly about that final, okay, <laughs> Tozen wins, and this is the first time we've had two black female winners. Yeah. Right. Well, That's the there first was time. no 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 other, and this is what was really crazy for. Uh, this year at CETA because no black woman has ever won CETA, not ever. No one single black woman has ever won CETA. And so we laugh and joke and say that it was a double win because Amina and I are both black women, and so we kind of broke that barrier together. Well, kind of. You destroyed the barrier. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. I mean, exactly. you obliterated it. Two black women, so no black woman, not even with a white guy or with, with a white woman, has ever won CETA. No. <laughs> wow. So, uh, how do you feel about that? Um, I feel like it was an honor because so many black women had came before us and paved the way for us to be in that position for people to even consider our arguments or to even allow, you know, like our bodies to exist in debate. And that's black women in the debate community and not in the debate community. And so for us to, you know, finally get there, I think it was just like an honor, you know, like I couldn't believe that, you know, it happened to us because, you know, so many black women I think deserved to see that they didn't because, you know, they were setting the groundwork for us, but, it was an honor. Now, now, did you ever even know that that was the history before you went into the tournament? Well, no. So, like Georgia Rashid, I didn't really debate that much in high school. I debated for a year and a half, and um, last year I was pretty young. 
I was 17 debating in college. So I never really knew anything about the debate community. So I just, as people tell me, you know, oh, you broke this record or you're the youngest to do this or you're the first black woman to do that, I just go with it and just trust that they're correct. <laughs> I know, right? Like, you don't know you don't know any different. It's not like you've been involved with a whole long time with it. Yeah. Um, so, so all right. So you were able to win against Oklahoma, but but tell tell us what your record was and what you debated. Um, so our record, we were eight zero. So we were the top seed at CETA, and we didn't lose any rounds. Um, and but you would have to be the first ever, I guess, to do that too. I mean, right? I mean, because if there's if there no been no black women, then obviously, I mean, you'd be the first ever, I guess. To be yeah, I, I, I guess so. I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure about I that mean, one. I would assume. I don't know. But um, the oh. argument that we were running was about uh, the way that systems of power function and the way that certain. So the overall resolution for the debate community is, you know, the restriction of the war power authorities of the president in areas like targeted killing, cyber warfare, whatever. And so instead of, like, affirming that topic, we kind of took, like, a critical approach to that topic and really kind of tried to figure out why presidential war powers existed in the first place. And so we looked at, you know, the way that presidential war powers or war powers in general was being enacted on black women you know, people like Renisha McBride, people like Cece McDonald. And we kind of recognized that it was because we sort of devalue black women and their existence. And so our affirmative called for a reevaluation of black women's lives uh, in a process to sort of create an intrinsic value to their lives, you know, in a world that sees them as meaningless, that we can be like, hey, we actually have meaning speaking. So, yeah, that was pretty much the argument we were rolling with at Theta. That's some heavy stuff. Now, um, I, so people haven't been able to, this would be your affirmative, right? This is what you, yes. were, you were affirming the resolution saying that this is what we should do and this is how we should carry it out. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Then there's a negative position against each of you and no one, I guess, was able to defeat this negative position that says, no, we shouldn't. Right. Now, that includes, that negative also includes Oklahoma, which I guess wasn't able to, were you affirmative or were you negative in the final round against Oklahoma? We were negative in the final round. Okay, so you were able to defeat their affirmative. Right. All right. Before we get to Oklahoma, I have one other thing. Um, I'm understanding that the House and the Senate, was that the local House and the Senate did something about? It was the, a state. It was a state. <laughs> it was the it was state. It was state, yeah. Baltimore. Mm-hmm. Okay, and, and what did they do? Um, so when we got back home, we got, like, these emails from uh, our state legislator, and they were just like, we want to recognize you all. And I don't think that we really realized how big it was until, you know, uh, we got uh, to the state capital, Annapolis, and, you know, we were recognized in front of the Senate and the House and we were given a resolution that was like, on this day, Amina Rothman and Corey Johnson representing Towson University were the flat, first black women team to ever win CETA or national championship. And so they presented those things to us. It's pretty cool. Wow. Congratulations. What what are your what are your friends saying? I, I know that you've got friends outside of debate. I, I, do, do they even know what debate is? What are they saying about all this? Yeah, well, okay. Truth moment is that debate in school takes up so much of my time that I don't have, like, a whole lot of friends. The few that I have are, like, really ecstatic, and they are like, oh, my God, and, yeah, but <laughs> for the most part, I'm kind of solo just a little bit. <laughs> okay. All right. Fair enough. All right. So hold that thought because that's one piece of history. You hear the history of what happened, the Cross-Examination Debate Association, two black women for the first time ever win, and the second all-black final in two years there, and just an incredible uh, proclamation by the House and Senate of Baltimore. Now, let's go over to Oklahoma, which was actually debating that final round at Cross-Examination Debate. 
which were the top seed, first ever black top seed at the national debate tournament, and had for the first time, Rashid, a member of that team, was the number one speaker for, this is the first time it's ever happened, a black man, black woman, black anybody, being number one at the national debate tournament. How did you guys do it? What 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 happened? Me, <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, honestly, we just uh, this was my last season. This is my last season debating ever. So you know, uh, this, is it's, 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 it's my last tournament. So I was just trying to just really debate in every round like it was my last. And my man Rasheed, really, he was on another level. So he was just like, <laughs> like. I really felt like I was like a Scotty Pippen, and he was like Jordan, but nothing. I was old, you know what I'm saying? And I was just riding this curtail, and I was just doing what I had to do, though, because I, I was too in. You know what I'm saying? I was checking negative. You know, I was giving them last speeches, but Rasheed was carrying the number one speaker, you know, but it was my last time going, so I was giving them all. I also think that the reason to why the success is so high amongst black debaters is that there has been a recent evolution in debate since, like, the employer stuff has happened. And it kind of was already coming um, to where black debaters have been just, like, uh, I guess, uh, fantastic on just debating and being confident inside of debate rounds in front of all white judges, in front of all white debaters, and just knowing their positions and knowing what they're talking about more than white debaters know what they're talking about. So I think that combined with our passion, our dedication, that we got a lot more riding on it than the white debaters do, that, you know what I'm saying, the last tournament, all that combined just created a fantastic two tournaments, you know what I'm saying, two national tournaments. Yeah, no, she, and too, I got to throw this there and be honest with y'all too. Uh, we didn't have to debate Corey and Amina either at the NDT, so that kind of was good too. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we got to avoid Corey and Amina. We knocked over all the top white teams of the country. Like, it was them, so it was cool. You know what I'm saying? Right. Well, let me, let me, let me, because you you were undefeated at NDT with the exception of one losing one ballot. I'm understanding what their three judges. And every round leading up in prelims, pre-elimination, uh, pre-elimination rounds, and you won every single ballot at NDT except for one, and you still beat the team. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. So almost perfect. It was almost a flawless victory. And the guy, just just for the record, the dude who did drop the one ballot, I, we have never seen this guy before. He, had, <laughs> I want to say he really didn't understand. He didn't understand what was going on, so he was just kind of That there. happens a lot. We call those lay judges. <laughs> right. <laughs> we call those, and, and to explain to the listener, a lay judge is someone who is very new to the process and really you just kind of gets thrown into a round. Exactly. <laughs> and we could right. tell uh, from his facial expressions he wasn't following as much, but, yeah, it was, it was really good. Well, let, let's talk about for a second, Rashid, because this is a special moment. The moment they said that you were the number one speaker at the National <laughs> Debate Tournament, did you know that you had just shattered history, And number one? And number two, how did you feel about that if you didn't know or if you did know? The, the, t- I, I, the same truth, I didn't know. Like, people started telling me all the history afterwards. I didn't know if it was history as soon as it happened. I knew that I was determined to get the top speaker award because they award you with this watch. And I remember last year uh, we had a first round at large bid to the tournament, like a first round invitation. And I seen the top speaker get a watch. And I was like, next year I'm going to get that watch. <laughs> what? So I was just telling myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I you told ready for myself the bling, Rashid? Rashid, you need the bling. <laughs> I needed the bling. I needed the bling. So I was so dedicated to the watch. And then progressively, as the tournament was going on, I stopped caring about the watch and was just so focused on, like, you know, every time that I spoke, you know what I'm saying, because it was George's last tournament, I wanted to make it meaningful and I wanted to make everything I say be concise and, you know what I'm saying, Chris. So uh, what happened was, was they got down to, like, the – they did it from the top 20. So they got down to, like, the the fifth speaker, right? And then my, like, you know, I, I started getting, like, weak in the leg because my heart was beating so fast. Uh, then they went through, like, once they got to five, they started naming people who won top speaker last year. So uh, they got to number two, and I believe it was Alex Miles, right? It was from Northwestern University. And they, they're the ones who won the Copeland. 
So all they had to say was the second speaker, and then they said the word North, and then everybody just went crazy because they knew they knew it was only me left for the speaker award. So it was it was a it was an amazing moment. But all I could think of was just you know what I'm saying the George's last tournament combined with just you know the adverse. You were talking about <laughs> you were talking about adversity. Like I was thinking about like. Like me being from Oakland and just, you know what I'm saying, me being homeless. It was just all the terrible things that have, you know what I'm saying, happened to me uh, in the past that have, you know what I'm saying, built me into the man I am today. All those just flashed before my eyes when that was happening. So it was, it was a wonderful moment, though. You Definitely. were once homeless? Oh, yeah. It was. <laughs> you got to highlight that man out there. But no, it was. Uh, it was a. It, it was times in Oakland where stuff got rough. Let's say, say the least. I'm from uh, East Oakland, California. It's not the not the prettiest place in America. Let's just say that. Uh, I've been there. And... Yeah, I've I've driven around there actually. <laughs> I I don't think that's advised actually at night. <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah. I, it, I mean, it was a it was a, a progressive it was a progressive move for me to get involved with debate. Um, even though nobody from where I'm from knew what debate was, uh, really, besides the kids that I was with in my UDL, uh, and to to be like a, a instrument for them, for them to see, because you know nobody from the league besides one person actually competed at CETA, uh from my UDL. But I, other than that, nobody from my UDL Bay Area or the Bay League has did anything big on a college level. So for them to see that was like you know it was a, it was a big thing. So. Well, I'm glad you said the, the, the debate leagues. I, I, did you? Would you want to say something else in conclusion? No, no, that was it. I mean, the, the, the debate league is progressive. We got to try to get it to uh, <laughs> try to get it to get bigger and bigger. I mean, you right. know, speaking, the, uh, speak, I think, yeah. Speaking of that, is getting bigger and bigger. Let Let's talk to James for for a minute. James Rowland, who's on the phone with us. You 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 were instrumental in this debate league that that everybody's talking about. That's that's funneling black kids and inner city kids into debate. Talk to me about these wins. Oh, this is unbelievable. Uh, I I don't I by any way, shape, form, or fashion. This is a tremendous uh, testament to the to the potential, the capabilities uh, that I think a lot of black youth have. Uh, you're literally talking to three individuals here that I consider some of the best and brightest young people in the world. Not just not just locally, not just black, but in the world. Their intellect, their dedication, their capacity to uh, advance an argument and to do it with such passion and and such um, intellect is second to none. And I think that's what you're seeing is that when we give our youth an opportunity to really shine and give them the skill set and give them the tools necessary in order to uh, bring about these type of uh, achievements, they really disguise the limit. And uh, so I've been fortunate, and I, and I say it with every sense of humbleness and, and deep, profound respect uh, to work with young people uh, like the ones you have on, on, the, on the show today. And uh, we have been able to do what we call urban debate leagues, and they're in cities all across the United States, and they really just try to provide young people an opportunity to cultivate their voice, to give them an opportunity to figure out how they want to articulate change for their communities, how to articulate change um, in their lives. And as a result, you see what the byproduct is. You know, you're giving young people who may be not in the most desirable circumstances, but some that are also bright, exceptional young people where debate has given them uh, another another set of skills to go to the next level. Uh, and so, and no pun intended. That's I, I, my shout out to to Oklahoma. But go, <laughs> yeah. the, the, but to really do go to the next level in terms of understanding who they are, what they want to advocate for, and really talk and making material change in their life by having these debates with some of the best and brightest students across the country. Debate has always attracted uh, a, a high level students, but uh, traditionally they've been white, affluent, and male, unfortunately. And so urban debate leagues have attempted to try to change that landscape and change the playing field. And so um, so I would tell radio audience out there, if, there's, if they're in cities all across the United States, to look look those look those uh, urban debate leagues up, see if there's opportunities for them to get their students involved. But more importantly, even if they don't exist, let's get our young people doing the type of things that can create the next Corys, the next Georges, and the next Rashids. Speaking, speak. I heard somebody want to insert something. Go, go ahead. 
Oh, I was just saying this is only the beginning. This is like the, 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 the real beauty of this is that, you know, the kids that are about to come next year from high school, from UDLs inside the college debate league, uh, uh, kids who are going to summertime and summer camps, they're way, like, <laughs> they know more about debate than we did when we were in high school, let's just say it like that. They know more about debate than some of us even in college right now know. <laughs> so it's about to be like a, uh, I mean, a real revolution in debate is about to occur. So, I mean, it's a beautiful thing. It's only the beginning. So this is just only, <laughs> only the start. Speaking, speaking of that, let's talk for a moment and, and real talk here. This is a white activity and had been right. a, a, until like 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, 2, 13, now 14. We got two black women winning, chosen at cross-examination debate. We, we've got you uh, taking top speaker at national debate tournament, top seed at national debate tournament. Okay, what 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 kind of response are you getting from this largely affluent white community? And the reason why I, I point that out is because a big part of doing well in debate is debating when you're in your diaper, all right, mm-hmm. and, and all the way up. And these these white kids have a lot of them have been debating since you know uh, since, since since their formative years, all the way up to college, you know. And they've there been there've been a lot of money. That has that that have been thrown at these big schools like Harvard, uh, in in Dartmouth, etc. That focus on traveling these guys and girls so much that they are ready for these tournaments and that they're ready to win them. How have your wins? And I'll start with Tozen. How have your wins been received? Um. Well, I think that. To understand debate and debate history as previously just a white male's activity and then seeing sort of people from different uh, social positions like kind of start to phase in. So you saw, you know, white women phasing in. You saw a few black men phasing in. And so, you know, after Davon and Devin had won CETA in 2008, you saw a, a big, a big response by the debate community, you know, as far as black men starting to phase in, you know, a lot more black men, still not enough by far, but a lot more black men were competing and being more successful on the circuit, and I think that on the debate circuit, and so, you know, last year, I think it was really tough for Amina and I because um, last year, so there's the national debate tournament, and the top 78 teams get invited to go to this tournament, and we were the only black women at that tournament, you know, and so seeing the community's response to us, they don't know whether they should like it, that two black women are doing well, or whether, you know, they like our performances, are we too angry, are we too sassy, are we too, you know, sometimes black women for the community. I think that that sometimes does happen with us, and that is the community's response to us, is they don't know whether to, like, love it or dislike it, you know, because just at the NDT, this this uh this past NDT, I was told that I was too mean to a debater from Georgetown, and you know, in my mind, I'm like, I'm just performing me, you know, that's me, and that's the way that I exist in the world. And for someone to tell me, you know, no, you can't do that here, I think that you know, that's just showing or telling of the community's response to black debaters doing well, because I do think that while you know, we are succeeding in, like, we're exceeding the expectations of how black debaters should be doing in this space. I also think that there is backlash to our success because of that, you know? By far, definitely. She she hit it right on the head. All right. George, you said she hit it right on the head. Yes, sir, she did. Hmm. Uh, Any other stories you guys want to tell, Rasheed, George? I think, uh, her experience uh, can uh, perfectly put it in context how she just won a national championship at CETA, and then days later, you know, teams that, uh, like, that, that they're like, I know she can, like, who I know they, who is purely better in debating and better, you know, and just understanding, you know, uh, like, especially this topic or whatever, or better, and they were losing to them. I felt like it was kind of like a little bit of backlash as far as having three judges. Because, yeah, I remember sometimes in the back of the room for the listeners or whatever that we don't know these people. Well, we don't know. We understand that she was political views or whatever, and and pretty much all of us collectively are going against the the, the rules of debate. 
we're trying to win in ways that saying like we should focus on the big picture and not the line by line. Or, you know, we should we should focus on like the big picture ideas and not like the little small little bitty arguments or whatever. And some and, and a lot of the judges like they didn't they didn't come to no debate as as an activity or whatever. So so a lot of the times or whatever, some people are instead of evaluating the debate, they're putting they they they're they're actually debating their argument instead of evaluating the debate. <laughs> Or 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 they're thinking like, hmm, if my case was to debate this, what would we say to this? Instead of like actually evaluating the debate. So sometimes you get that that, that, that kind of like biasness in 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 the judges. And I feel like Corey and Amina can that that the NDT experience can and can can protest to that. Hmm. Let's, yeah, let's, so, so, so like so like so like so, so, something that's like something that's uh that's unique for the black debaters that come in talking about. Like the African American experience in, the, in in America, and talking about you know what I'm saying what the government is doing, you know, like real quickly or whatever. A lot of those times we debating we debating who we debating like across the room, and we debating the judge also simultaneously. Wow, wow. Rashi, you had anything you want to add? Uh, <laughs> I think that they <laughs> he spoke to it pretty directly. Other than the battles with the judge, the fight to be yourself inside of a white activity. It's definitely a white activity, you know what I'm saying, amongst everything. Uh, and, and the, well, the third thing that George is telling me right now is that um, outside of just debating, right, we have different ways that we articulate arguments. Hence, I'm an artist, right, so I uh, I rap, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a spoken word, right? So in my debate rounds, I use my spoken word and my raps and my spits as arguments, literally, as, like, to go against, you know what I'm saying, an author like Zizek or Heidegger Nietzsche or something, right? I feel like the my articulations of my, like, you know what I'm saying, a, a, a rapper, essentially from a domestic area or an urban area, would answer the arguments in which, you know what I'm saying, Nietzsche or, or Derrida has applied to the debate space, right? A lot of times those things are seen as less intellectual, right, and unintellectual in general. So basically what happens is it's not only this battle between the judge and, and the, the debaters, but it's also this battle with the fight internally to be seen as intellectual in, uh, in spaces like to where you're uh, in a general way that you're not, right? So like uh, when we talk about different people as if as, as this, like Tyler Kweli or Tupac Shakur, these people are not seen as intellectual as a person with a degree which you don't know or, you know what I'm saying, that's speaking from this university. Uh, so, I mean, those struggles emerge, but I do think one of the things that compel, I have to say this, it's so interesting to me, after our, our success, right, as black debaters inside of a white, you know what I'm saying, activity, uh, it's interesting to see the different reactions between white folks, right? So you have some people who are like, uh, you know, totally against it. This is not the activity that I, I got in. And then you have some people who are like obsessed with you, right? Like, 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 uh, like uh, trying to. I mean, want to want to be in every debate round. Like you had Corey, ask Corey and Amina. Like they will have debates, and it will be white like debaters standing outside in lines to try to hear what they're saying. People streaming the debates, commenting on the YouTube stream, everything. Right. So it's it's. I mean, that's a positive, and it can be some negatives. I think the positive of those things is that a lot of white people are learning about racism and are learning about how they uh, implicated themselves inside of white supremacy unknowingly from our debates. They learn, like, I have white people come up to me these last two tournaments back to back, at least, I want to say at least 20 people coming up to me telling me how I've changed their lives just for me debating. I've helped them confront the racism that they've been perpetuating their whole lives, and they didn't know it, right? And these things happen to all of, you know what I'm saying, like the men and So along with the fight that we have amongst, you know what I'm saying, the, the implicated white supremacy that we got to deal with with the white activity, there's also this beautiful, like, you know what I'm saying, change that's erupted amongst white folks just because we're there doing what we do. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I do know what you're saying, and, and, and I, that's <laughs> beautiful. Uh, we, we, we're changing it from a, a womanistic uh, view. We're changing it from a racial view. It's, it's right. incredible. James, tell tell folks how they can get their kids involved and the importance of debate as we close. Well, I think I think you're hearing it. I think the the fact that you're hearing these young people articulate in such profound ways uh, their experiences and how they've been able to advance arguments that are germane to them, that are uh, centerpieces of how they live their lives and claim, reclaiming, I think, uh, the humanity 
that comes about by learning these skill sets is is what I think every young people, we should have every young people want to strive to have. And I think I read one time that to be human is to have voice. And what you're seeing is that these young people have voice. Uh, and so I would encourage, yes, we, we I think getting your young getting young people involved in the activities like debate are so very important. I, to me, it's like the next civil rights movement. We need young advocates. We need young people able to speak truth to power. And one of the ways in which they can do that is by participating in, in debate. And there are urban debate leagues, there are regular debate leagues, uh, there are different formats of debate, but the type of debate that you've heard uh, these young people speak about is policy debate. Uh, but I would I would dare to say that any debate is better than no debate, and we need to create and continue to create cultures and communities that young people are debating about what 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 does it mean to have a community that's uh, that's equal? What what does it mean to have a material change in, in in the way in which Black people and people of color live in this in in this country? And um, and those are really tough issues. We're leaving a world. We live in a world where I always say we need to develop critical thinkers for a critical time, and we live in a critical time in this, and debate that fosters that critical thinking that can help so many young people. So, all your radio, Lydia audience, do a search on Google. Look up Urban Debate League. Look up Debate Leagues. Anything that you're going to get young people to have critical conversations, develop their oral communication, their critical thinking, critical reading skills. Those are the type of things we need to be pushing just as much as we're talking about running with a football, bouncing a basketball, uh, trying to twerk or do something else. We need to create atmospheres where people see the multiplicities in which black blackness can be operated and in which it can be shared so people can understand uh, that we have so much to offer uh, on so many different fronts.